and welcome to video number two of um, paleobiogeography in which we're going to be looking at some of the principles of paleobiogeography so defining some terms and then we'll finish by looking at some things called biogeographic provinces um, and look at how these change over deep time so let's start off by looking at some of the different flavors of biogeography that exist um, so the kind of different ways we can divide the fields to make it easier to understand. So I think the first useful division to make is to highlight that biogeography can both be descriptive. So this is describing and recognizing patterns in the distribution of species, or it can be interpretive. So this um, actually tries to explain those patterns. So it looks for causal explanations of species distributions. Studies in the latter form interpretive biogeography where we're actually trying to explain distributions can then be themselves split into two kind of categories and these categories are either ecological or historical biogeography and really the difference between these two um, kind of types of interpretive biogeography are just the scales that they look at so ecological biogeography searches for causal explanations of the distribution patterns at short temporal and spatial scales. So we're looking at um, limited time frames on, for example, uh, a continental or smaller scale. In contrast to that, historical biogeography concerns more evolutionary processes that may occur over millions of years and will occur on the scales of kind of continents. This is a difference that's illustrated um, by the realization or the recognition that two locations in the world with very similar abiotic characteristics such as temperature and precipitation may have identical functional groups of organisms in them and they may be very considered very similar from an ecological point of view so that's the ecological perspective however they may have quite a different species composition so the species that actually make up those different um, animal communities and that take on individual roles could be radical di radically different and this marks the difference between ecological and historical biogeography i thought it'd be useful to have a very quick example to illustrate this so looking at climatic conditions in the temperate arid and semi-arid regions of north and south america respectively the conditions here are quite similar. So actually, from an ecological point of view, these ecosystems look relatively similar. However, in the North American steppes and prairies, like the one that I show in the image here, um, we know that these plants have evolved under intensive grazing from uh, bison, for example, while equivalent taxa, so large members of this group um, that bison belong to, called the ungulates, were ambescent from South America at the time when these grasslands evolved. So if we're thinking about this within the kind of framework of ecological and historical biogeography, ecological biogeography on its own can't account for that lack of ungulates in South America. That is to do with the configuration of continents in deep time. But also, um, historical biogeography on its own can't explain the nature of the arid and semi-arid vegetation that we get in Central North America. That has evolved in concert with the bison. Um, and so these two concepts are quite strongly linked. They need each other to explain the patterns of biogeography um, as fully as we would like to be able to. Bear in mind, of course, since um, this lecture is focusing on paleobiogeography, uh, we'll be more thinking along the lines of historical rather than ecological biogeography much of the time. As part of this introduction to the area, I also wanted to talk about, um, oh, sorry, I wanted to define some terms for us. So um, here we go. Let's define some key terms. An endemic species is one that is local or regional. And the property of being endemic is called endemism. That makes sense, right? So I've put a um, definition of endemism on the slide for you. Endemism is the situation in which a species or other taxonomic group is restricted to a particular geographic region due to factors such as isolation or response to soil or climatic conditions. Okay, so for example, all of these species that are shown here are endemic um, to the Galapagos Islands. So they are um, found only there in many cases. A contrast to that is the idea of cosmopolitanism. 
So a cosmopolitan species, or one with a cosmopolitan distribution, is one which is widespread. So the definition I've put on the slide here says it's a species that's found in many or all parts of the world, from the Greek cosmos, world and polites citizen. So that's cosmopolitanism. Be aware that sometimes you may come across the term pandemic, referring to a distribution that's um, somewhere in between these or overlaps with cosmopolitanism. This is often avoided as a term due to the um, obvious uh, overlap with um, epidemiological topics. So for example, we're suffering from a pandemic right now, but also it has a relatively poor definition. So some consider pandemism uh, to be between endemism and cosmopolitanism, so widespread but with a few gaps. And there's this, this term has suffered from inconsistent usage. So I wanted to highlight that it exists, but then I also wanted to uh, say that I won't be using it much further today. Bear in mind also that endemic species, so these species that have like distinct geographic ranges, rarely occur in isolation. Where they are found together, this is something that's called provincialism. So uh, I'm going to be going into this further on the next slide. So provincialism or provinciality, I've seen both of them in use. I don't know if there is a correct answer here. But this is the association of species within well-defined biogeographic areas or provinces. Each province contains a distinctive assemblage of species, some of which are endemic, so confined to that area only. So this is kind of like a step up from a single species is the, the collection of species when uh, in a particular area. So this idea of provincialism reflects a useful concept and that concept is the biogeographic province. So I've put a definition of this term on the slide for you as well here. A biogeographic is a province is a biological subdivision of the Earth's surface, usually on the basis of taxonomic rather than ecological criteria. Um, it embraces both faunal and floral characteristics. The hierarchical status of such a unit and the total number of um, such units varies from one authority to the other. But you can see, um, to illustrate this on the slide, I've put one particular definition up, which, is, um, which divides the Earth today into six main biogeographic provinces that are labelled on this map for you here. These particular provinces are based largely on the work of a, um, a scholar called Philip Sclater, as, along with Alfred Russell Wallace in the late 1800s. So provinces are characterised by their endemic species which have restricted ranges, in co contrast to cosmopolitan species. So that's how we define our provinces. But I want you to bear in mind before I move on that this is just one of a number of schemes that are used to define biogeographic regions. Uh, and these schemes are often based around different things. It could be species composition, such, with our, such as our definition here, but there are a whole host of other ways of dividing up the world into, for example, different ecological zones, um, which are different from the definition that I've given you on the slide. So other biogeographic units that are used in other schemes include biogeographic realms, or sometimes these are called ecozones, um, bioregions, floristic regions, ecoregions, or zoogeographical regions. So these are all different ways or different concepts we can use um, to partition space in the real world. So just be aware that those other definitions do exist. Um, but for our purposes today, I think biogeographic provinces is a very useful definition, and it's one that we'll be using um, throughout the rest of this lecture when I'm talking about these divisions. Bear in mind also that biogeographic provinces existed in the past as well. I put this video in the last, sorry, I put this video, I put this image in the last video to demonstrate that fossils in deep time are like, are key to kind of building a clear picture of the distribution of continents. What this diagram actually shows, and I kind of glossed over it last time, is uh, the Carboniferous and Permian distribution of taxa of a range of different species and genera, including the Glossopteris flora. An example of Glossopteris is shown on the left-hand side here. So this is known from fossils across the world um, and is this green zone here, along with the Mesosaur uh, Mesosaurus, sorry, fauna. Well, this was a fresh water reptile shown on the right here. And this is 
represented by this blue blob here. And there are a couple of other important species for our purposes here. And the correspondence of these fossil faunas and floras across the southern continents suggests, and did so to Wegener and others, that South America, Africa, India, Antarctica and Australia had all been a single continent at one point and have drifted apart since. More generally, provinces like this have been recognised throughout the Phanerozoic, both on land and in the sea, and in a great many different um, groups of organisms. So those are basic observations of the kind that can be made by hand, and indeed were for the, um, for the purposes of the early debates on um, plate tectonics, for example. And these can now be supplemented um, using a computerized paleogeographic systems or GIS to kind of better quantify the distribution of these um, different fossils. And I wanted to finish this video with a highlight, kind of like by highlighting the um, distribution of provinces through time. So just as plates, the Earth's um, tectonic plates move through deep time, the positions, shapes and sizes of biogeographic provinces also vary. Barriers and migration routes come and go, climatic belts fluctuate with changes in climate, and there is a turnover in animal communities associated with this as we look back into the deep geological past. So I'll provide a very quick whiz through how these change through time. Now, these provinces in the Precambrian were dominated by microbes and they were very different from those provinces that we see today, which are defined by a great diversity of animals and plants. And indeed, it's far harder to get a handle on what provinces may have looked like when we go before the, um, the Precambrian period. There is some evidence in the late Precambrian um, that Ediacaran biota um, had some provinciality. In fact, there's some really cool recent research. I've put the, um, uh, a reference to uh, the paper that I've used as a source for these images on this page here, um, that has used a technique called network analysis to understand the distribution of Ediacaran taxa. There's a network shown on the left here, which is just a, um, a collection of relationships in both space and time between different taxa. And through this analysis, the authors have demonstrated that the Ediacaran system contained a number of environmental ecological biotypes. So these are, um, a, a, I guess, an equivalent of our provinces, as well as a series of assemblage biozones. So these are time-based divisions that are shown in blue and red on the right-hand side here. By uh, doing this analysis and unraveling these two, um, the authors have managed to show evolutionary and ecological changes that led to the Ediacaran Cambrian transition, as well as presenting evidence for um, extinction events at this time. So that's a really exciting piece of research and a good example if you want to dig a tiny bit deeper into the more quantitative approaches that um, modern uh, studies are using to understand uh, paleobiogeography. So that's the late Ediacaran, which for our purposes is that the first point at which we can see provinciality appearing. As we move into the Phanerozoic, so this is the Cambrian and onwards, animal communities of the early Paleozoic were clearly grouped into biogeographic units. So as an example, during the Cambrian and the Ordovician, provincialism across most marine groups was fairly, fairly clear, it was well marked. And this is particularly true of the brachiopods and the trilobites. These are really, really useful to, as we will learn in a later video, unravel the history of past continents. There was an interval of um, cosmopolitanism, so widespread species in the Silurian period, but this shifted into more provincial groupings by the mid Paleozoic, so as we're going into the Devonian and the Carboniferous period. More widespread faunas of the early Carboniferous were succeeded in traditionalist views by higher degrees of endemicity during the later Carboniferous and the Permian. So the picture here is that you go from having this widespread set of species to more, more provinces, better defined provinces, as we move into the Carboniferous and Permian. And people have traditionally argued that both latitude and continental separations acted to increase this provincialism. 
You may, though, want to compare that with the um, paper that I mentioned in the paleoecology lecture by my colleague Emma, Emma Dunner and colleagues, which um, actually showed the opposite using quantitative analysis. So um, bear in mind that many of these general patterns uh, we've built up over many years, and not all of them are withstanding the scrutiny of modern techniques. But we can say that floral provinces were clearly distinguishable by the Carboniferous and the Permian period. An example is shown on this slide here, and this is an upper Carboniferous map for you. It shows the Carboniferous globe um, during a glacial phase. So in this green zone in the middle, we've got a tropical ever wet forest. In the blue zones here, we've got um, subtropical forests. These were sometimes seasonally dry. In the orange, we had deserts. And in the red zone, um, you can see here, there was a, um, a temperate forest. Whereas in the purple zone, the equivalent of, in, of the south, um, there were southern hemisphere temperate forests. And these actually differ quite significantly in the um, taxa that are found in them. Uh, the gray on the bottom here is kind of like a, a tundra type environment. Um, bear in mind that this is based on this really cool paper from 2017. Um, you may well want to check out. And the authors of this highlight that all of this, this kind of broad picture of different distributions, is kind of overprinted and strongly influenced by both topography and climate, including oceanic, oceanographic, sorry, uh, influences. So do bear in mind that that's a general picture that there's quite a lot of nuance to it. Throughout the Mesozoic, we can say that marine faunas generally had simple patterns of high latitude and low latitude provinces, with occasionally significant local variation. During this time period, terrestrial faunas and floras, i.e. those on land, started off recovering from the Permian Triassic extinctions. And in, as part of that discovery, that discovery, that recovery, sorry, the, um, the land fauna developed provinces. During the Jurassic, provinces uh, stabilized on land, and then the sea's ecosystems reached their kind of full complexity of re recovery after the PT extinction. On land, the provinces that we see were dominated by dinosaurs, and in the oceans, provinces were defined by um, ammonites and a variety of marine reptiles, such as the fantastic reconstructions that I've shown on the left-hand side in, in the middle here. The rise of the flowering plants during the Cretaceous period provided um, an additional provincial signal um, towards the later the end of the Mesozoic. On the right hand side you can see an example of an Antarctic forest from about 120 million years ago. Um, and the same is true of the um, widespread faunas of the Chalk Sea. So we can kind of see these um, provinces developing um, with the evolution of life throughout these, the Mesozoic. In the Paleogene and the Neogene, um, changes in plate tectonic configurations dictated that provincial patterns approached those that we see today. So that's when things get increasingly similar to what we see when we look outside the window today. But even so, we need to note that ancient provinces are still reflected um, in the world today. So we still have what we may term Gondwanan and Laurentian distributions of plants and animal groups. So I'll get onto that with, with an example in the next video. So that was it from this video. I will see you shortly in video number three. See you.